Well, good morning, everybody. I'm looking forward to uh, many of you joining me this morning. And uh, we're going to be looking at Philippians chapter 4, the last section of our journey through the book of Philippians. If you are here, please say good morning. It would be great to have you. Uh, you'll need a Bible. And we will be reading from Philippians chapter 4, from verse 10. Um, I think this will be the last time that we look at Philippians although I may get caught up in some of the things that I want to say to you and we may have to return to it next week. Um, if you are watching, I would love you to do something for me. Um, if you can press your finger on the like button and hold it there for two or three seconds, what that does is it automatically creates an algorithm and a message and sends it to your friends and contacts on Facebook and others will join. So if you just press your finger on your like button on your Facebook page now as you watch me, and hold it there for two or three seconds. That'll send a message to other people and hopefully they may join us too. That would be really terrific. And also you can just like the broadcast and that'll also send a message to your contacts. But just keep your finger on the like button and hold it. And please do feel free to make comments on the, um, the devotion as I bring it to you because that always encourages other people to join us. Good morning to so many people. Brian and Jane, Peter Knight, good morning Peter in Cardiff, it's lovely to have you with me, uh, thanks for taking the time to be uh, here today and all across the United Kingdom it's great to have folk. We are going to be reading Philippians chapter 4 verses 10 to the end in a moment. It's a remarkable passage of scripture uh, that teaches us a great deal about the grace of God and about his mercy but you will need a Bible because there are two or three passages in 2 Corinthians that I'd also like to read. Uh, to you uh, because they help us to understand some of the things that Paul is saying to the Corinth to the Philippians at the end of his letter. Um, if you do have a Bible with you then we're going to read and pray together. So Philippians chapter 4 verses 10 through to the end of the chapter is what we're going to read. Um, let's pray together. Father I want to thank you for people that are joining this podcast from uh, across the United Kingdom and across the world and I thank you for the thousands that will listen to it this week. I'm so dumbfounded by the faithfulness of women and men who create this little community on a Sunday morning and I'm so thankful to you for the power of your word and its truth in our lives and I want to pray for every person who will listen to this and watch it both those that are online now and those that will join us a little later. Would you give grace and strength and comfort to those that need it? Would you give courage and resilience and determination? We open our hands before you, Lord, recognising our own frailty and aware of our need of your grace and of your mercy and of your strength. At the beginning of another week, I can say of myself, I know that in the week that is gone, I have not loved you always as I should. There are moments when I could have done more and I didn't. And there are moments when I should have done less and I didn't. Thank you for your generous forgiveness and mercy through Jesus Christ. And I pray that you'd help us to live in that mercy and to be aware of it and to lean into it. We acknowledge our weaknesses. We acknowledge our frailties. And we thank you for the wonderful promise of your spirit's presence and power with us today and with us always. So please would you take this story, this passage from Philippians and speak into our hearts through it by the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's read Philippians chapter 4 from verse 10 through to the end of the chapter. I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at last you have revived your concern for me Indeed, you were concerned for me, but had no opportunity to show it. Not that I am referring to being in need. For I have learned to be content with whatever I have. I know what it is to have little. And I know what it is to have plenty. In any and all circumstances, I have learned the secret of being well fed and of going hungry. Of having plenty and of being in need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. In any case, it was kind of you to share my distress. 
You Philippians indeed know that in the early days of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, except you alone. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs more than once. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the profit that accumulates to your account. I have been paid in full and have more than enough. I am fully satisfied now that I have received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. And my God will fully satisfy every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The friends who are with me greet you. All the saints greet you, especially those of the emperor's household. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. God always blesses the public reading of his inspired and his infallible word. What I think is really remarkable about this passage is the extent to which we can discover something of the lessons about contentment and trust and Paul's attitude to need. I think that it is probably one of the most mistaught passages of the New Testament, particularly verse 12. That verse that says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I have heard so many preachers turn that into a prosperity based sermon. You can get victory, you can have blessing, you can have power, you can have anointing, you can have health, you can have healing, you can have strength. And certainly those things are all gifts that God gives to his people from time to time. But the passage doesn't teach that. The passage teaches that whatever our situations are, whatever we are facing, good or bad, well or ill, strong or weak, we can have contentment. To take Philippians chapter 4 verse 12 and to turn it into a, a verse through which we claim victory is to ignore what, first of all, what victory is and secondly, what the passage itself teaches. Because it's not about a victory of circumstances, it's about a victory in Christ that is never affected by circumstances. And uh, that's such an important thing for us because so often our faith and our contentment and our peace is dictated by the circumstances that we find ourselves in. Not so for the Apostle Paul. In fact, when you read through um, verses 10 to 23, or 10 to 20 anyway, um, I think it, from an easy kind of way of remembering it, I've written down there are three things that I think are uh, talked about in this. Uh, firstly, concern. Secondly, contentment. And thirdly, consistency. Let me first of all address the issue of concern here. Uh, Paul is clearly writing to them in this section of the letter as he finishes it off to thank them for the gift of money that they have sent to him. He talks about it in uh, verse 17 and verse 18 when he says he's thankful for the gift that Epaphroditus had sent. So it's, it's in the context of him thanking them for their generosity to him that he talks about his contentment in all situations. But I want to first of all talk about this issue of concern because even just for a few minutes, there are several things in it that I think are really moving. In verse 10, obviously, we know that he is thanking them for their kindness and for their generosity. But he picks that up again in verses 15 to 18, when he says, you Philippians indeed know that in the early days of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving except you alone. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs more than once. And then he thanks them for the gift. I think what's really interesting about this passage, as a pastor and as a missionary who is, um, who is used to having to depend on the generosity and faithfulness of other people, um, it is as old as the church itself for a lack of support to be shown to those that are engaged in service where they are dependent on God's people. Verse 15 uh, tells me that Paul was clearly in need and yet the only people that helped him consistently were the church in Philippi. 
but he was grateful for that support. Um, I, as a person, am committed to supporting mission and supporting missionaries. Can I ask you to consider being the same, to find a way of investing in God's work in another part of the world other than your own church? That might be through mission giving to your own church. It might through be through supporting the Baptist Missionary Society or the Elam Mission Society or um, Elam Missionaries or Anglican Missionaries or the Church Mission Society, whatever it is. But find a way of supporting um, people that are on the cutting edge of God's work. Who might you be able to bless today by writing them a cheque and popping it in the post, by making a transfer, by sending them a box of chocolates, by sending them a card telling them how much you appreciate them? You have no idea the blessing and the encouragement that that would bring to somebody. Paul's writing to them to thank them for their gift. Verse 15 tells us that he received support from them alone. But verse 15 also tells me that they were committed to that support. And verse 16 tells me that they were consistent in it. And I love the way uh, verse 18 describes their concern and how they expressed it. The gift that they gave to Paul, he describes as a fragrant offering and a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. Every time we give to God's work, we are giving first to God and it is a fragrant, beautiful, perfumed offering. What a wonderful picture of giving and it is a sacrifice. It costs us to support God's work. It costs us to invest in God's people. And I'm not talking about uh, Dundonald. I'm not talking about me. I'm talking about the work of God. It is a an honour to be allowed to be part of it. Um, and it's a, a very practical way of showing concern for God's people and for God's cause is to support God's work. Now, um, when we give, God does something very powerful in our hearts in verse 17, Paul says to these people, not that I seek the gift, I seek the profit that accumulates to your account through the gift. So when we give, something happens in us, we open our hearts to trust in God. We displace the idol of money and power in our spirit. And we put ourselves in a position where we can receive a, something of a deeper revelation of God's grace and mercy. We can't buy that revelation. But how we handle our stuff will demonstrate where our spiritual life really is. If we hold on to it, then we are being controlled by our stuff, by our materialism, by our things. If we are afraid of giving, if we're afraid of releasing, if we're afraid of letting go, then it's a clear demonstration that actually our security lies in our stuff, not in who God is. But if we are open-handed with our stuff, then we learn to trust in God's grace and God's provision and God's kindness more. Now, that is the context that Paul writes to them uh, to thank them for their gift in. So the first thing is the issue of concern. Show concern for God's work. Show concern for God's people. If you know someone who is ministering for the Lord and is dependent on the salary or the income of a local church or of um, missions giving or whatever, be generous with it. Now I come to this issue of contentment, which is such a, a powerful thing in this passage. And it's really picked up in verses, uh, in verse 12, almost verse 12 alone. Although there's a parenthesis in it. In verse 11, Paul says, not that I'm referring to being in need. And in verse uh, 17, is it? Yep. Not that I seek the gift. In other words, Paul's whole argument around um, concern and contentment is rooted in his trust in Almighty God. Um, verses 11 to 14 are really important here. And if you're online, press that like button again and hold it because this is a really important principle for people facing life, not just about money. This is about circumstances. This is about situations. This is about daily um, pressures and burdens and hassles that we face and how God can help us through them. It is such an important spiritual lesson that if we get it, something is fundamentally changed in us. So I'm going to read verses 11 to 14 again, and then I'm going to comment on them. Not that I am referring to being in need, for I have learned to be content with whatever I have. I know what it is to have little, and I know what it is to have plenty in any and all circumstances, 
I have learned the secret of being well fed and of going hungry, of having plenty and of being in need. I can do all things through Christ or through him who strengthens me. They are really important verses. Fundamentally, Paul's demonstrating his heart and his attitude was one of trust. The word for contentment here is what's called a hapax legomenon. That means that it only appears here. It literally means in Greek, written once or once written. It doesn't appear anywhere else in the New Testament. And it's, it's the word autarkes, and it means, and this is going to sound odd to you, but it means fundamentally self-sufficient. Now, I don't think that we can take that as meaning that Paul is self-sufficient. I think when you read the context, what he is saying here is, I have learned that in the end, I must make a decision to trust Christ in the circumstances that I find myself in. No one can make it for me. My wife can't make it. My children can't make it. My family can't make it. My church can't make it. In the end, when I face a set of circumstances that are blessings or that are challenges, I must make the decision for myself. I must find the resolve. I have to find a way of knowing what it is to be able to trust God on my own. Make the decision and place the trust in him. Verse 11 makes it very clear. Not that I am referring to being in need. Now we know that Paul is in need. He has been in need. He's writing this letter from a jail. He has faced many circumstances that are difficult. And I'll come back to that in a moment. Yet in verse 14, we see here a deep sense of thankfulness, a profound sense of thankfulness for the gift that the Philippians have sent through Epaphroditus. He says to them, in any case, it was kind of you to share in my distress. And he had genuine needs. We know that from verse 15 and following. And yet he has contentment. I have learned what it is to be content in all circumstances. If the letter is couched in an atmosphere of concern, it addresses the issue of contentment. Now, listen to the couplets of verse 12 for a moment. He talks about being content and knowing what it is to have little and to have plenty. That's the first couplet. The second couplet is to be well fed and to be going hungry. That's the second couplet. The third couplet is having plenty and being in need. In other words, Paul's contentment is rooted in something other than his circumstances. He knows the extremes of physical hunger, of physical need, of spiritual um, dryness, of a lack of company. He knows what it feels like to be alone and abandoned. He knows heartbreak and pain and sorrow and struggle. Yet he has not been given contentment. He has learned contentment. He has found a way of discovering how to be sufficient in Christ. In any and in all circumstances, he says in verse 12. That is both a particular and a universal promise. So let me ask you a question. Any and all circumstances, what situation does this not cover? And the answer is it covers any and all circumstances. There is no situation where this principle cannot be um, activated where it cannot be used to help us to discover contentment in any and all circumstances, having plenty, being in need, being fed, being hungry, facing want, facing plenty. In any and all circumstances, I have learned what it is to be content. Now, this is where I want to read to you, just to help you to understand it, and I know you will need this very well, two or three passages from Paul's letter, second letter to the Corinthians. The first is in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, where he talks about some of the challenges that he's facing. Listen to verses 7 to 12. We have this treasure in clay jars, so that it may be made clear that this extraordinary power belongs to God and does not come from us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus 
may also be made visible in our bodies. For while we live, we are always being given up to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus may be made visible in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. Now, listen, just two chapters later, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, it goes from verse 3 um, all the way down to verse 13. C, we are putting no obstacle in anyone's way so that no fault may be found with our ministry. But as servants of God, we have commended ourselves in every way. Are you listening? Through great endurance and afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labours, sleepless nights, hunger. And then he goes on to talk about purity of knowledge and so forth. Another set of incredibly difficult circumstances. And then 2 Corinthians chapter 11, as he's finishing the letter off. Uh, from verses 21 to the uh, end of that chapter. And this is, I think, really powerful. Listen to this. But whatever anyone does boast of, I am speaking as a fool. I also dare to boast of that. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they descendants of Abraham? So am I. It has echoes of what he said just a few chapters earlier in Philippians, doesn't it? Are they ministers of Christ? I am talking like a madman. I'm a better one with far greater labours, listen, far more imprisonments, countless floggings, often near death. Five times I received from the Jews 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I received a stoning. Three times I was shipwrecked. For a night and a day I was adrift at sea. On frequent journeys in danger from rivers, danger from bandits, danger from my own people, Danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers and sisters, in toil and hardship, through many a sleepless night, hungry, thirsty, often without food, cold and naked. And besides other things, I am under daily pressure because of my anxiety for all the churches. Who is weak and I am not weak? Who is made to stumble and I am not indignant? Paul knew deep hardship and contentment and here's the key 2 Corinthians chapter 11 verse 30 if I must boast I will boast of the things that show my weakness the God and Father of the Lord Jesus blessed be he forever knows that I do not lie in Damascus the governor under King Aretas set a guard on the city of Damascus in order to seize me but I was let down in a basket through a window in the wall and escaped with his hands. It is necessary, verse 1 of chapter 12, to boast. Nothing is to be gained by it. But I will go on to visions and revelations. And he goes on to say this. It is in Christ that I boast. There's the key of Christian contentment. Contentment comes through these things. I have learned what it is to be content in all and every, any and every circumstance. Uh, listen, uh, go back to Philippians chapter 4 and you read uh, the rest of it. I, verse 13, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Contentment comes when we recognise Christ's presence with us by his spirit. Contentment comes through holding on to the promise that he has made us through his word. Contentment comes through trusting in his will and seeking to live in it. And contentment is about being strengthened. The Greek word is un endunomeo. It's this power being given to us because of the presence and purpose of God in our lives. That's the contentment that carries us through grief and sorrow and loss and pain and death and sadness and everything else. A contentment that is rooted in what Christ has done for us. Saul was strengthened like this in Acts 9.22 uh, when he was converted. In, Acts, in Romans chapter 4 verse 20, Paul says that Abraham was strengthened like this when he had to trust God. In Ephesians chapter 6 verse 10, Paul uses the same word again when he says to the Ephesians believers, be strengthened, be strong in the Lord and in his power. He tells Timothy that he was strengthened in 1 Timothy 1.12 as a pastor in this and as a leader. In 2 Timothy 2, 1, Paul says to this young pastor, Timothy, you then, child, be strengthened by grace. In 2 Timothy 4, 17, Paul looks back over his own life and he says this, the Lord stood by me and strengthened me so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might, might hear it. 
for I was uh, received and I was delivered from the lion's mouth. He had this sense of strengthening because he was putting Christ first and serving him. His circumstances didn't dictate it. That's what it means to be content, to know that in God we have everything that we need. I know I'm a little longer this morning. Please bear with me if you can. Concern, contentment and consistency. The consistency here is that the uh, Philippians continued to support and help Paul's ministry. They gave again and again and again. We know that because of what he says in verse 16. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs more than once. So three simple things, concern, contentment, consistency. We can play our part in supporting and strengthening others by showing concern and being consistent. But we can discover contentment by finding ourselves in God and allowing his purposes and his plans to be central in our lives. I'm going to finish off uh, Philippians by looking at verses 21 to 23 just now so that I can start something fresh with you next week. And in verses 21 to 23, Paul says goodbye. But the way he says goodbye is beautiful. Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The friends who are with me greet you. All the saints greet you, especially those of the emperor's household. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Paul ends this letter the way I want to end this set of teaching on the letter to the Philippians. He reminds these people that there's one church. And what better way could I finish the, this little um, journey through Philippians than reminding you from across the United Kingdom, watching on Facebook in various contexts, from Cardiff to Italy uh, and in several countries around the world, that we are one church and that we are together. Paul wrote from dire circumstances, imprisoned even in the emperor's household, there were believers. Wherever you are today, whatever you are facing, whatever you are going through, grace and peace be with your spirit. Uh, it is wonderful to be part of the family of God, to be able to share with you through technology what a gift it is to spend some time together. But be reminded of this long before there was an internet, long before there was a Facebook Live facility. The Holy Spirit is consistently and constantly with his people. He's with you where you are. He's with me where I am. He binds us together in love. He will finish this journey in us and we will see Christ. May God bless you. May God encourage you. And may God strengthen you. Thank you for journeying with me through the book of Philippians. I am really, really thrilled that you have taken the time to do that. And I'm deeply grateful to you for it. Um, I'm going to pray and then I'm going to tell you what we're going to explore together from next week on. Let's pray. Lord, Give grace and strength to my sisters and my brothers across the world. Thank you for their consistency in joining with me week by week. Thank you for their encouragement, for their help, for their affirmation, for their support. I pray that the words of this little season of teaching in Philippians will have blessed and encouraged them and that they will know your grace and your mercy and your strength. And I ask you, Lord, to pour your spirit out upon them by your power and to remind them of your mercy and your majesty. And may each one of us today know your grace and your strength. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, I'm going to stay online afterwards just to chat with some of you as much as I can for about 20 minutes or so. Uh, please share this uh, little video. Let people know that you've seen it. Just put it onto your Facebook page and uh, tell them something about the whole series. I can't believe that we're finishing this little series on Philippians. Next Sunday morning, I'm going to start a journey through da, 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 the book of Ephesians. We're going to journey through uh, chapter by chapter and see what God might teach us as we take a devotional expository journey through this wonderful book and see what God might uh, inspire us with, remind us of and encourage us by. In the meantime, wherever you're going to church, I'm going to be preaching in Dundonald at 11 on the Sermon on the Mount, on being salt and light. We're doing a series on that. You're welcome to join us on Facebook, um, on our Facebook page, Dundonald Elam Church. And then tonight, I'm going to be preaching on living free from regret. What a, an inspiration God's word is, and what a privilege it is to share it with you. Thank you so much, and God's richest blessing on your life today. Bye for now.